Hire somebody. You're welcome. (laughs) That is the fundamental answer to everything you're not good at. Hire somebody that is good at it, know it well enough to know if they're doing it well. This portion is like with me, so I think this is when you need to get selfish. Like you need to ask your question. Hiring is guessing, firing is knowing. Like you gotta go fast. That's how you get shit done. That's how you figure stuff out. This is the television. And the television is the radio. So four D's, motherfuckers. So with the three studios, I can't be everywhere all at once. That's right. And it's really easy for me to get the wind taken out of my sails. When some when 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 one of the locations isn't delivering on your standard? It's the individual people themselves. So right. I'm like crazy about this. I'm super, super driven. I know everybody can be amazing and successful and they just want to pay their bills. So I'm dealing with your, em- your, your, your employees. Yeah. Okay, so a couple things. This is really funny because this is probably the first thing I ever started really talking to my dad about as a kid, as somebody who had like gifted wisdom at, like you know like I you know like it, what keeps me super like mellow is like mm, my thought process and like the things that I do well are gifted DNA and circumstances so I never get high on my own supply cuz like it's just so weird that this was probably the first thing I started talking to my dad about when I was 15 years old I looked at my dad one time when we were driving and I said dad if they were you they wouldn't work for you this is something we Talk about 28 years later, my dad brings up that statement. Cause he's like, you were a kid. Like, your ideology for what everybody should be doing is the quickest way for you to struggle. There's a very big difference, like, like, I have enormous you know, energy on like, impacting people in a good way, whether it's directly attributed to the people that work with me or the masses, whether that's through heart or hustle or whatever it may be, but, but you have to become, deeply aware that there's only so many things you can handle. The other thing that it really leads to is it leads into you trying to control something you can't, which then takes, up, it, this compounds and like yeah, takes it's over. It's, it's, it's a losing proposition. First of all, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad in it. There's a lot of ego and a lot of your own shit that you need to like really understand that truth. Like, it's the same bad that I have. I create entitlement because I try to take on too much on myself. You know, and so like there's, you gotta be careful with this one. Here's what I would say. Your job as somebody that sits at the top of something is to put players in the best position to succeed. Once you've done that, you've gotta allow them to do their thing. You're a capitalist trying to deploy almost socialist, communist ideology. You can't control everything. Like, there's nothing wrong with paying your, what, what, what's wrong with paying your bills? They're capable of so much more. Says who? You don't know them. Yeah. You don't know them. I know, I know Caleb solidly, I know Nick solid. like, you don't know? Your fucking, your fucking spouse and parents don't know you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let's get to like real talk. Yeah. There's not a single person on earth that actually knows you. Every single person has certain little subtle things that they still have not articulated to the world. To not one person. It's an, you're being ideological to, to scratch your own itch. You have to understand that. I think a, a bigger thing is where are you going with that, right? I think if you're going into a place of like, they could be so much more and we can win together, which would make sense to me, right? You, let me help you be a better employee, you'll do better, we'll do better, right? You're better off firing them. I knew you were gonna say that. I hate <laughs> Me too. <laughs> me too, but my, me hating firing people creates, what I do with it is I create entitlement and protect people at my cost, which makes them think they're better than they are. You're, you're not firing people is you're imposing an ideology on them. Mm-hmm. You're making it about, you could be so much, you're putting it on them instead of yourself. You don't want to fire them because they're not capable of over delivering or delivering on the standard of what you need for your business. Mm-hmm. And so the way you're deploying that resentment is deploying them to feel bad that they're not achieving 
their capability predicate on something that you need them to do in the context of your four walls. So I just need to get the right people in there. I'm at my best when I fire fast when I know it's wrong. And I do that rarely because I don't like it. Mm-hmm. But I've gotten better at it. <laughs> but you shouldn't create, you know, you know, you're putting, you know, resentment comes out in very different ways. When I'm resenting something, I'm razzing people. Like I'll make jokes. That's my way of getting it out. Um, you're not doing any favors looking somebody dead in the eye and say you could be so much more. It's doing nobody a favor. You're not, it's not doing you a favor, it's not doing them a favor. What you need to be thinking about is, first and foremost, the number one thing you need to be thinking about is the three managers or the one regional manager, the people that are actually responsible in the trenches, that's who needs to be a a hundred. You fix that, you fix everything. Don't focus on the sink, focus on the well. Everything I'm worried about in the thousand employees here is predicated on my 11 direct reports that run those departments. Got it? On the managers. The managers. Right. If the three managers are perfect, then you'll be set. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> I know. I know. That's how it works. That's how businesses work. You've only got two variables in your, that you're talking about. This is why it's easy for me to understand. I know they're not right. And then underneath that, the employees you have, either they're underperforming because the manager blows and you know it, or they've just been around for a while and you have actual human emotion to them. And those are both valid. But the quickest thing that will make you so much happier is to make sure the three managers are phenomenal. Yeah. You have three, I would assume, per yeah. location? They basically deal with all the happy stuff and if anything goes wrong, I'm the one that has to come in to deal with that. You've created that, just mm-hmm. like I created here. Yeah. You need to uncreate that. And what is fine at a smaller business level, and it's why it worked for me at Wine Library, is when it's smaller, there's a level of fine, but if you have ambition and for it to grow, you need to, you know, you need to get the value out of the way you're compensating. You're, you're better off compensating more and letting people do the defense and the shit as well. Okay. Got it. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Um, the first one, with combat being, combat debt being kind of my main main business, yes. about 45% of my business. Um, but I was not in the military, I was not in law enforcement. So it's a, a target market that I appreciate very much, but I'm not really a part of. I, I think that as long as you're authentic, you know, there is a small subset. In any subculture, there's always a part of a, that group that will always be like, well, you're not one of us, <coughs> so you have no permission here. But if you speak to admiring something, um, as long as you're clear cut about that and not hiding and trying to avoid, I think, um, I think you'd be surprised on how much of a non-issue that is for the 89%. Okay. Because one of my... Because the 11%, manager, yeah. ...was a military, you know, retired yeah. military, and they have their stuff made in China. But they don't tell anybody that. They're like, oh, we're military owned and operated, and so they get a lot of business. I feel like they get a lot of business because of that. that and and that's and the consumer's always right. Like you can't focus on that. You, you have two moves. You're more than welcome to make a video and be like, look, I have deep admiration for our law enforcement and our military and here's why. And I'm extremely proud that we make our product in America and we have competitors in the marketplace who've been in this space, but they make their product in China and you the customer should decide. Would you say that even though the yes. they, even though they claim, I, I, they claim to make I, it? <laughs> I would because that's how I roll. You don't need to. But you, I'm not a big fan of dwelling without action. Either you never dwell about it again mm-hmm. or you mention it. Okay. But the middle blows. Right. That's what you're doing. <laughs> like, like that's the game. That... The reason I don't complain, like, like, like the reason I genuinely don't is I've got a very basic thesis. Either I do something about it or if I've decided I don't want to do something about it, which is many things. I don't do something. There's certain things that cross places where I'm not comfortable and I keep my mouth shut because there's too much energy wasted in dwelling. Your competitor has you on defense. I spend, I know nothing about my competitors. 
The consumer is the only thing that matters. I just don't care. The whole like, you'll, you can learn from them. Like I'll learn it anyway. Plus I'm not worried about the past. This is what's great about being in the trenches, right? Having a rest, like gr- I have come to learn that growing up in a liquor store and a baseball card table, my whole life was I'm behind something, somebody's coming, I watch what they do, something happens. Consumer, the end. So yes, I would because I would like to create the conversation of that because I think it's a competitive advantage, especially if they're not authentic about it because then you can get, you know, people are very (laughs) curious. You put it out there, people start digging, they find, right? In a podcast the other day, I mentioned that I was in a WrestleMania. I showed up in this WrestleMania and I said, I was once in another WrestleMania. I got the clip now, somebody found it. People dig, people dig. (laughs) You set it up, let somebody else make the expose if you don't want to go all the way there. Innuendoing is fun. And when I can keep putting clips of us manufacturing the chips and nobody else can. That's what I would do. I'd put out the clip and be like, here we are in Iowa making the chips. Well, I don't know, where do you make the chips? Bay Area. California. Great. Here we are in Bay Area making the chips. Be fun to see our competitors show where they make the chips. <laughs> Everybody knows what you're saying. Right. Okay. Uh, my other question yeah. is um, my story's similar to yours. My first business card was when I was 12. Love it. And my sister and I sold baseball cards Love and it. photo buttons. Do you know my whole, do you know what's happening with these sports cards? Like, dude, <laughs> on a very serious, I cannot believe what's happening. I'm like freaking out. It's coming back. It's about to happen. Anyway, nonetheless. So um, my parents had a trophy business. They still do, 40 years. So cool. Um, that's what I grew up in. So cool. Um, and so when I decided to go off on my own, the business I started was called ABC Gifts and Awards. So why you wanted to be the first in the yellow pages? Yes. You know that. By the way, do you guys know that that's why so many companies are named yep. ABC? The yellow pages was so, and AAA. The yellow pages were so important. The Google of their day, you wanted to be first, and the way you hacked it was by being AAA. Yep. My parents were A and B Creative Trophies because there was American trophies in the same town, so that was got ahead of them. Isn't that funny? Um, cool, so right? So that's what I started with. Ah, li- <laughs> liquors. That, I used to think that. I was like, maybe we should rebrand to Ah, liquors. <laughs> like when I was a kid, because I realized hacks like, came natural to me, nonetheless. So I, that's where I started off, but very quickly got to the poker chips. So the business name didn't have anything to do with poker, and I never changed it. But over the years, I've acquired many of my competitors. So now I'm Nevada Jacks Poker Supply, I'm VR Pro <laughs> Poker, I'm Palm Gaming but they're still all separate. Okay. So I don't know if I should, being that it's still 55% of the business is poker, would you say I should combine all and start maybe ABC poker or something? Why? That's the most important. Because it's so fragmented. For who? For you on the back end, for the consumer? I think for the consumers. For us, it's not a problem. So for the consumers, what do you think happens? Um, they get confused, I believe. Why? Because we've got different products on different sites. So we don't have all the same... Do they know that they're even associated? Some people do, some people don't. The question is... Does it matter? Does it matter? And then what are you trying to accomplish? You know, like, you know, to me the reason to consolidate is you've got a big commitment to building a brand and that when you flip it, there's going to be a delta on the brand value. Right, so when you sell a business or when you value a business, there's the EBITDA of like, here's the profit. And then there's a thing above it, which is what's the brand worth, right? The reason to consolidate is to build a brand. I would not call it ABC. I would create a brand, right? That would be the biggest reason to consolidate in my opinion, based on what you're saying. I don't have any intention of selling. Then, then there's no crazy reason other than maybe you just want to manage one site, maybe you're curious on what it's gonna mean. Maybe there are some curiosities of like, but like, you know, if you think about it, I assume these are web-based driven businesses, right? Yeah, so. You're gonna give up. Right, that's why I've no never shit. done that because. And I'm you're not giving me a compelling reason to. Okay. If you're gonna give up all that SEO juice, all that brand equity, all the people that, and I'm gonna, guess 80% don't give a fuck or know that you have seven other sites and now you're gonna consolidate them all and they're gonna, 
you know, like type in what, you know, palm, whatever, and it redirects to this. I know what, but then it's like, ah, that's not my, dude, let me tell you a great story about Wine Library. We built a new store on the same fucking plot of land and everybody decided it was a different store and that we were more expensive and we dropped prices. People don't like change. The second you redirect, they're gonna be like, "This is th- somebody bigger bought my people, and now it's more expensive, or not as good." You know, right. I just don't see the value unless you've got a strategy for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I really debated asking a question about our company as a whole or versus like my role. And okay. I just started back and going with my role. <laughs> yeah, really. Be as, yeah. This is like, listen, we're here, right? Like, yeah. let's so let's do it. One of the things I mentioned is. You're trying to change other people's opinions of it. Thank you, yes. This is a very important starting point. Absolutely, and you're absolutely right. Um, change their opinions about it. It's not an easy thing to do, especially in a small market like Alaska. Um, and it's not easy anywhere. Just, you know, like, let's, you, good news, it's not an Alaska thing. It's a human thing. It's, Humans are really good at putting the past on a pedestal and demonizing the current. Very good at it. And we reworded that same kind of position, but it's the director of client experience. Fine. One thing that I'm finding myself challenged with is walking that line between giving too much. Of course. Because I care so much about my connections, especially in Alaska. It's a small market. Yeah, um, reputation, small yeah, town. So I yep. find myself giving some clients, which are those smallest clients, the most attention. I have no idea how to cut that. Like, where, where I can identify it when it's happening. It's I can very. See it, it's. I can feel I love it. It's very easy. I'm going to give you really good advice. <sighs> Disproportionate honey on top of vinegar. Okay. So, we've decided that Sally's hair saline has got to go. She's grandfathered in at a rate that we no longer can deal with. She's disproportionately time consuming in return for the ROI, but she's massively lovely. It's no different than firing somebody. You know what my advice to people who struggle with firing? Give huge severance. It works, let me play it out for you. We're all playing the same game, ready? You don't like firing somebody? Give them four months severance where most people just fire them and they have to go on the street. I promise you, you're gonna sit on firing them for more than four months. Now you're Mother Teresa and you've solved your problem. You pay them to go away. A hundred percent. You're not valuing, the money isn't as valuable as the, t- you being on defense is so expensive. You telling somebody, look, we're going in a little bit of a different direction, I'm giving you a six month head start, I will help you hire a different agency or hire somebody, I'll interview them, it amortizes out. You feel great about you and you solve the problem in a way that's disproportionate honey on top of vinegar. Love that. It is good. <laughs> it is good, it is good, it's good, it's good because I'll tell you why it's good. Because I'm a successful businessman who does that. I understand it. I don't give it, adv- what's so fun for me about giving advice is I only give advice I know. And like I know this move works for a certain type of individual. For my dad it's the stupidest thing he's ever heard. Just walks in and goes, you're fired. We're done with you, Sally. That's how he rolls. He's cool like that. And that's amazing. That's a strength that I don't have. I have my disproportionate honey with vinegar. Nobody gives fucking two months severance in the tattoo parlor business. So even if they, and by the way, sometimes I've given disproportionate honey with vinegar and they're like, you're a fucking asshole. Even when I've done things that make no sense. But not three years later, they come back and they're like, actually, in hindsight, now that I've lived on the other, grass is greener, mm-hmm. you're actually extremely nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's what you need to do with clients. You need to fire them okay. in a way that's amazing for them. Okay. Once you recognize it, you go into how do I solve this issue? 
Did you give them a, a time period where yep. you're like, hey, we're going to work on this because it's a challenge on my end? And like- yeah, you, you make them part of the process. Okay. You walk in and say, this is not working for our business anymore. You tell them the truth. Like we're evolving, and it's we we you know the time allocate. We only you know I can only I only have so many hours in the day, and the business requires this, and so, but I don't want you to have collateral damage from this decision in the short term. So let's put together a six month strategy. We can we're happy to stay on. I will try just as hard, if not harder. I tell people what I'm doing. Like I tell them, I tell people what I'm doing sometimes. Please, and, and just please, to piggyback on please. Too, like, you said something uh, when you said that it's just not like we can't afford it anymore because we scale a lot faster than we thought in one year. So yes. what, we're, what we were offering a year ago yeah. is like totally our, not our business has changed. Yeah, and so our that, business has changed. That's not your fault. We're so grateful that you signed up with us a year ago. Mm-hmm. Let me help make the next six months transition awesome, including helping you hire the replacement or helping you hire somebody internal to do, sorry, no, uh, doing what we do. It's honest. It it's honest. Done to me before, just to throw it out there, and I've ended up in such a better spot. Really? So on the off- receiving side of that offer, huh. it's worked out great. I'm super really? grateful. Okay. Yeah, because like because those. anybody right. once you're half pregnant, the great back to giving the advice that I gave you, like my ego of, I can't fire this kid. He doesn't have a college degree. This is now wine library talk. I do it here where kids can get jobs. We have a great job market right now. They worked at Vayner. Even now, they have Vayner's fucking in their LinkedIn. They, they're more than capable. And I'm still like, uh, but there it was, like they, here it's easy. There it was impossible. I was building up kids who like had no other leverage in life besides the fact that they'd been with me for two years. And it wasn't so easy to replicate because Wine Library was at the top of a small thing. So it wasn't they going to go to another liquor store and get that much. Uh, but that was my ego talking. Every kid that I thought could not survive in the world mm-hmm. without me went on and got another job and survived plenty and some did better. <clears throat> yeah, so I think that's what you gotta do. Thank you. It will work. Yeah, so, so my question is kind of like before that yep. happens, before we get the client. So we, like you said, it happens everywhere, right? When we're talking to people and we can show them case studies or we can show them whatever. Maybe we have four meetings with these people, a potential client or a lead and we're showing them all these things. How, is there anything other than case studies or showing them actual work that you did to, to no. shift that thought? No. And where do you draw that line of like trying to... Earlier trying than to you have them? been. Yeah. The, be, the thing I'm best at is bailing quick. I don't try to sell unsellable people. So let me ask, so to that topic, let's Please. sell them. You, you get them on, now they're on with you. you you've had the whole thing and it yep. went great. We have a client like this and mm-hmm. they're one of our large Yep, ones. go ahead. Everybody in the, now we're in the dirt. And yep. we're like, okay, here's the game plan, here's how yep. we move. And now they're totally pulling back and not allowing us to... Yep. Happens all the time to us too. Yeah, to manage that. Like now it's like all on what they want. They're the I, I call them as the CEO sometimes and say, look, you hired VaynerMedia and now you're trying to make us act like Ogilvy. I go, you should just hire Ogilvy. And then they have to make a decision. You have to be willing to walk or do what they say. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we struggle with all the, time. all the time. And by the way, we're happy, like I can't get to everybody in this company the size that we're in. We're doing what they say in place, plenty of places. There's not a single client at VaynerMedia that does exactly what I want them to do. Right. Not one. Not one. Right. Yeah, I, I'm just not ideological. I have points of view. I'm very comfortable articulating them. But I don't have full say. They're paying me. I'm in the client service business. So we just have to figure out where our... Where the line is. Where the line is. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think, you're, I think the one thing that will make a lot of sense to you, I'm very comfortable doing what a client's forcing me to do since they're... My dad, I'm bringing up my dad a lot, which is fun. My dad has a, had a, like a great... Like there's this great, great Russian saying that he would always like bring up because it was his leverage. But it, like I heard my uncle say it, and but like it's a classic Russian saying, you know, like whatever American sayings we have. It's uh, whoever pays for the music gets to pick the song. And I fucking love it. Like we don't have a, like I don't know the American, like there's so, you know how that's what's great about knowing other languages, there's some great, like I love, clearly I love analogies and sayings. I love that one. That's how I think about VaynerMedia. They're paying. Here's the one thing that you should do though. You should die on your own sword. Meaning, 
No problem, big client, we're happy to do it. I just want to remind you that it is our strategy to do this. I do that a lot. That's good to hear too, because we've kind of started doing that. In the beginning, we didn't have an option. Yeah, that's right. Like, you're like, yeah. like, you're like yes, thank you. Yeah. 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 I mean, what, Beggars can't be choosers. There's a good American one. Yeah. <laughs> we've been talking about that so much. Like, we've been talking about that so much in the beginning. We, I felt like we had to, we come with a proposal. Here's the cost. They come back and say, absolutely not. We're going to pay this much. And we would just do what of the course. Big cost was for that amount. And I think we had a major win recently. We, we decided we gave a cost to a client. And they said we can't afford that. And, and you're like, they knocked see ya. Down, but we also knocked down yeah. the amount of work, and it and it, and it went smoothly. Yeah, and that was a huge win for us. Like, to where we're not doing that amount of work for a smaller amount. Yeah. Of work. So we're starting to get there, but it just it's a process. It, yeah. Let them know where your sat, where your strategy sat. That's important. It's important. Cool. Cool. Thank you. you got it. So I initially didn't have any questions until I was here. Good. <laughs> I, I mean, generally mindset, like everything else, like I said, you know, from listening to seven years, and so you penetrated me very, very, very much. Good. And, uh, without a doubt, for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to have an opportunity to say that. But there's a few things that I was curious about. Like I have permafrost distributors, and like on all the social platforms, I'm permafrost distributor, <coughs> AK permafrost, permafrost AK, but, but I treat it more like a personal brand than anything, so I'm just document my own day, but it's still under the business Thank you. name. Like, I, like personal brand, business brand, blend of the two, like, I see it so, so seamlessly, like, yes. it's hard to tell the difference. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do as well. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think the reason that works for me, and I think it's something that I recommend, is I just don't think about it. Yep. I think people think there's, try to overthink it. You know, like, live your life. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you know, it's, it's uh, similar to the advice I gave you. There's a lot of people that wouldn't have given the advice that I just gave you. The business book ideology is consolidated. There's a lot of people that are giving you advice about your personal brand and your businesses that went to business school and are executives and companies and they give advice. The reason I love this session, this part, is I get to give you contextual advice after you've been watching higher level theoretical advice for a while. I listen. Right? And then I answer. So like, you know, people like, Gary, this is the favorite of every smart person I know. Gary, what happens to Vayner if you get hit by a bus? And I go, it goes out of business. And they're flabbergasted. They're like, what's your contingency plan? I'm like, life insurance. (laughs) They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, when I die, if I died by a car accident right now, it's really awesome that I bought so much life insurance based on my potential earnings that my family will at least achieve some percentage of that ROI, which I'm not even that pumped about because I'm on the new kick of not giving my kids anything, let alone, like, <laughs> like I'm on a whole different, I used to make fun of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates for giving, like, cause I come from immigrant, it's like you give your family, like, right? I was like, fuck those motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, they're brilliant. Your kids are losers, like on day one if you give them too much. Anyway, nonetheless, I say to them, it goes out of business, and they're flabbergasted. I'm like, bro, let me, and then I go into like, and usually these are non-entrepreneurs giving advice. I go, let me tell you something about Nike and Amazon and Puma and Chase Bank. It is far more likely that the CEO of Coca-Cola turns every six, seven years than me getting hit by a bus. And the second it does, that company changes forever. Like. I don't care what happens to VaynerMedia when I'm dead. I'm pissed that I'm died. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, 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 people are so confused. So anyway, back to this answer. Blend them. Yep. Play. Beautiful. What? Mm-hmm. When a company comes to try to buy it, they're gonna want you there for three years anyway and lock you in to be the executive that hands it off anyway. And so whatever personal brand equity you have, you're gonna be able to trade on. At best, guess what? When you leave after three years, you'll still have your personal brand and start your next shit. I move very seamlessly from wine to marketing and I'll move very se- seamlessly from marketing to sports car dealer. <laughs> you know. Um, and one, there's one other weakness that I'm really, really hard on is just picking up the phone and saying, buy my week. Like I'm, I like have a hard time being super salesy. Hire somebody. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that is the fundamental answer to everything you're not good at. Hire somebody that is good at it. Know it well enough to know if they're doing it well. Got it? Yes, sir. Know it well enough to 
know that they're doing it well. Correct. Okay. Just enough. Yeah. Sales is easy. I've hired you. I have a set expectation of what I pay you and what I kind of have a feel for my business. That's easy. Somebody to do your social media marketing when you have no idea about social media is hard. You don't even know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Got it? Yeah, know it well. And I'm, what makes me super interesting, I think, is I'm dangerous enough in everything that my company does, uh, but I don't need to be the best at it. I'm just the best at the holistic version of it. I don't think anybody in my company can beat me one-on-one, but a lot of people can have better skills within the subcultures of the craft. That whole like, what's that, brother? Uh, I brought a couple items later on. If Thank you. Out Happy to do it. <laughs> Happy to do it, brother. That whole like, I don't even really know what a Renaissance man is, but I think when people throw it at me on social, they talk about like, you do a lot of things, and I'm like, seems seems practical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, seems practical when you own a business for you to be dangerous enough to know everything so that you don't become vulnerable. People sometimes say to me, I don't deal with my finances. I'm like, you're in trouble. Yeah. You have a business. I don't like finances at all. I fucking, the, this is literally, I just sign every, everything my lawyers and my team puts in front. I don't have, but like, you have to know it enough. You have to at least understand basic, like, do I make more money than I lose? Every time, like, I have a great CFO, Alan, and he loves, to, like, I'm so offense. He's like so much more disciplined. He razzes, and sometimes he likes to allude to, like, he's the grown up, and I laugh, and I'm like, Bro, I've been in business for 20 years of my life. I've made every payroll in my life. It's street shit, family business. I may not, like, I do not know the tax law the way you do that can maximize some of our opportunities and I'm pumped and that's why I pay you a fuckload of money. Um, But I make my payroll. You know, you just gotta be basic. Shit's basic. Business is basic. The reason I'm so cynical to the current state of entrepreneurship is we have students in business now. Business is basic. Uh, we're we're having a great year. It's going really well. Good. We're about to be growing, doubling in size, which is going from two restaurants to four. So we're super excited. And do your partners have ambitions for it to be a national product? So we have uh, successfully failed uh, over the years. We grew to five locations out of state. We have three in Kansas City and two in Cincinnati. Franchise model or your own? No, we own and operate. Keep so going. Me and my kind of culinary partners are working just two of us. Love it. Um, so we were out there a lot going back and forth anyways. Couldn't get it off the ground. Shut them down, focused on Denver. Since then, Denver's just been like awesome. Mm-hmm. So it's super stoked. Cliche, you were stretched too thin. When you focused, it worked. 100%. Yeah. When grew and we shouldn't have, then stretched too thin. It was a silly, I think, idea to start with. And then we just kind of reshuffled, and now it's actually clicking and working. Yeah, when things fail, it's very obvious to look backwards and be like, yeah. right. <laughs> um, and one of my tactics with kind of that retrench is really to kind of pull things in. Or like, I'm even divided designing our website now, I'm managing our MailChimp myself and really kind of bringing all this in. I'm a big fan of pulling in and pulling back out. And that was going to be my question is that people say like, well, that's not sustainable, that's not sustainable. I'm like, yeah, I know. In theory. The next three to five years, yeah, right, in, in theory. How do you choose what to give up? Like when do you start thinking about the The, del- the delta between the things I like the most? Okay. Because I want to hold it all for as long as possible, right? The things, the, I, the things I like the most and the things I'm best at, I keep. Yeah. And the things I don't like and the things I'm not best at, I try to systematically give away over time. Okay. Cool. Just look at what you're Self-awareness at. and happiness okay. is the answer to your question. Okay. There's just certain, like, what are we doing here? Like, you have a business, like, to do what you like. Like, fuck it. If you can't, like, do you know how many people build a business that then the business eats them and it becomes a job? And like the thing you like didn't want to do like everybody else or the thing you ran away from becomes the thing with the added pressure and loneliness of entrepreneurship. So, the things I like and the things I'm best at. Okay. You know? Awesome. But there is, no, I love treading everything back in. Like, yeah, that's exciting. It's fun. I love you also it. hone your yeah. skills and then you get better at judging the people you bring in the next time. All of a sudden, your email marketing head is not going to be able to trick you that they suck because you know MailChimp. Yeah. I love that feeling. Yeah. I love it. Cool. You know? Follow up question. What's the most effective way you have found to teach culture? I find it so weird. Like, Firing. Going? Firing? <laughs> Firing. Firing. Money where your mouth is. 
culture's easy if you're willing to fire people that produce money that are assholes. Yeah. Firing, I'm good. I actually don't mind firing. I think I'm good. Really rare people. Firing. I don't mind firing. It's so, as so, so to me, what's that? It's just as important as hiring. Hiring, firing. You know. Firing's way more important. Yeah. Way more. Because hiring is guessing. Firing is knowing. Kalen, Kalen said. I used to, the way I hire like when I'm like left to my vices like cool yeah interested come on. Firing out. Mm-hmm. So you're saying your firing sets the tone of the culture. I do believe that. that yes. Well, cool, we're not doing that. There's nothing better than firing somebody who's cancerous mm-hmm. in culture. Mm-hmm. It sets the to- it builds confidence. Mm-hmm. I'm very big on that and then just articulating it. I mean every day people come in here like into my office like Gary like you know, people love fucking theoretics. Gary, what are we doing here? <laughs> I'm like, I put out content every, I mean, every day I've articulated that we're building a machine <laughs> that sells shit so I can buy a brand. Like, like it's like, like, like it's the most, like it's crazy. People have been here for six years. They walk in sometimes, they're like, Gary, you know, I feel like we've lost our way here at Vayner. Like, what are we doing here? I'm like, and I literally go into like Gary V mode, not Gary Vaynerchuk, the executive. I'm like, all right, well, we're building a marketing machine to, to hone my skills and meet people and train you guys up and then the economy's gonna collapse and I'm gonna buy Puma or K-Swiss or Hershey's. We're gonna run it through. I'm like, and they're like, like, it's like, I've been very consistent here. That's what we're doing here. I've been, right, Jesse? Like, it's been super consistent, but like, but like people, people love to like, people love to like pontificate and theorize. It's why I hate the advice that you guys get from not, I'm gonna say something that I genuinely believe. Anytime a non-actual operating entrepreneur friend of yours gives you advice, you should look them dead in the face and go, you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's why I like have gotten really quiet. You know, one of the things I'm most proud of is I talk about the same shit in my content because I'm not willing to go to places where I'm not willing to go anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it's like in those other places. Like I have theories, I have hypotheses, but until you walk in a man's shoes, you just don't know. Right? So, and especially entrepreneurship. It just, you know, it's all, people are talking theory. It's what, it's what gets people that are too socially liberal in trouble. And I'm socially liberal as fuck, but like everything's great in theory. Now go execute it. Go read communism. It's amazing. No, really, go read Marxism. Like it's super, like I want it. Just doesn't, it's not how humans work. And that's how I think about business. Cool. Yeah, you shouldn't micromanage. That's nice. You're going to a job tomorrow that's gonna pay you. <laughs> I have to go in here and be like the last line of defense of my business and right now, nobody's doing email marketing and I haven't hired anybody to do it so I'm gonna do it. Like, you know what I mean? We're in limbo at a chief strategy. We don't, our chief strategy officer left like last week on family reasons so we're interviewing so she's not here. I when we did Sasha, assume the COO roles from James Worsey. So I'm the CEO, COO, CSO, I guess for all intents and purposes, though I'm not. You know, like, ebbs and flows. I'm gonna hire somebody, am I gonna, like, you know, like, ebbs and flows. By the way, there's another one. Talk to people. Once you have a feel of what every person wants, and once you create a place that's safe for them to tell you the truth, you got a prayer, and take it from somebody who's really trying, it's super hard. They'll tell you, I send out fucking emails like once every three months with a video of me like come to, literally the video I did last Friday, right, was it? I was like, if you think that if you came and told me your boss is a dick face, that I would fire you or you're in trouble, you don't know where you work. Mm -hmm. Yet that's the biggest fear of every person that works here. Humans. Humans. But the one thing I can control is what I do. So even though I know that 80% won't act, it doesn't stop me from putting out the content in company-wide emails once every couple of months whenever I feel inspired, right? I keep pounding it. And then people that are here for five and a half years will go through something and then I'll get on the phone with them and they're like, yeah, and I'm like, why didn't you come and talk to me? And they're like, yeah. Well, didn't, you know. Okay, so, so the um, local thing, I got it. Yeah. Um, well, one of my biggest issues is marketing. So, okay. Um, 
it's just not consistent. We outsource to a to another company, and they it just seems like they're always kind of uh, like I'm always in the dark with it. They're not very transparent. Well, you should you need to change that vendor. Right. And Anybody you're paying that isn't willing to give you clean information is a problem. Okay. Period. Always. And I've changed them multiple times. Yep. Um, what about taking it internal? That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think that's smart of me to? You should taste like it. Not- you should try it. Okay. It's yes, it's smart of you, and I don't. You notice how like I don't like to do absolute answers, but based on multiple times, just learning what it looks like, what right. it feels like, is a good context point. Because when that doesn't work, then you can step back and be like, okay, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Like, or when it works, you're like, fuck, I should have done this all along. Right. You just need a context point. Right. There's so many things I do that I actually don't think are gonna work, but I do them because I need the reference point. That's actually how I built all of VaynerMedia. Most of what I did at VaynerMedia. 2019, 18. Most of what I did in VaynerMedia from 2015, 16, and 17, I didn't even believe in fully. But I needed the context point of what big agencies look like. And I needed to do it within my own four walls. And now I'm unraveling it. Mm. Last question. Um, do you think that, because growing up, my, my father uh, started a little uh, uh, baseball card trading <laughs> business. This is getting good. Do you think that I have tons of Those are garbage. Cards. They're garbage. Most likely they are. Yeah. Because that's what, it was like supply and demand stores. issues. The, the fucking 1980 baseball, let's start with baseball. Yeah. 1982 to 2000 and to like 19, to like to 1999, to Mike Trout time, to like, like all the stuff from like 80 to like 2000 is in a bad place. Kids, Baseball. Too much kids. supply. Right. Not right. enough demand. Right. But like 86, 87 Fleer basketball, gold. Because it was all because basketball's culture now. Like nobody wants a Tony Gwynn rookie card. Right. Nobody wants Wade Boggs. Nobody wants that. People want Jordan. Right. Culture. 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 Basketball won. Baseball's declining. Then that was too much supply. It's just supply and demand. Honestly, that's why I understand what's about to happen. I'm really good at supply and demand. And I know that the demand for sports cards is about to really go enough to make it move against the supply. Got it? Right. I think basketball's incre- I think basketball is going to be incredible. I think China is going to get involved. And when that happens, just think about Asia's money for Jordan rookies, LeBron rookies, Kobe rookies, Steph rookies. It's about to happen. Global, it's a global sport. Wow. And I think the the sneaker thing with kids like, you know, like it, it's cumbersome. These sneaker kids, first of all, you can't get as many off-whites and Yeezys and like limited edition Nikes as you want. Even when you were right, you're like, that's gonna be good. Like the, you know, the Fear of God collab is gonna work. So you can't get enough inventory. Whereas like if you make a hot take right now on Jason Tatum and you think he's really gonna be the guy, you can go buy 50,000 rookie cards. You know? Yeah, I think cards are about to explode. I think so. I'm really, I'm like, I can't believe it's happening actually. I heard you say that. The fa- I'm like, my life is getting so weird. I started a wine brand, I'm getting the car, I'm going backwards. You know, like, <laughs> I feel like an old man, you know, like, my, like, it's what happens. But yeah, no, I think it's gonna happen. Marketing, real quick, because I wanna bring you value. You, you guys do what? Cold calling, direct mail, Google AdWords? Uh, mostly Google AdWords. I think you should really focus on Facebook. Facebook? The older demo, if you were referring to that, are you going after older or are you going any house, right? Um, any house. How are you getting business now? Um, how, how are you getting doing, business uh, now? It's like a... Word of mouth? Versus home advisor. Yep. So we, you're, we you're, doing, you're in the referral business. Yeah. This is what I hate about services for real life. They all let all these companies that got in, fr- in between Google and them Home Advisor, Zillow, Open Table in the Restaurant World. What's that? And it's, like, it's all the same shit. You need to. That's what happened. Like just to give you a quick punchline of what happened in the world. Google. I was right about Google AdWords. I did a nice job and built my dad's liquor store. There were much smarter people than me that built platforms that sat in between Google and the business underneath them, and that's who built huge, huge companies, right? You got to get out of that. Get out of that. You can't be reliant on somebody who's a toll booth. 
What if they said the price is double? You're gonna pay. You have no leverage. Right. That's why I need to be on all these platforms. Whoever's, I'm not on, I'm not on whoever's closest to the customer wins. Right. When Amazon raises Prime by 40 bucks next year, you're gonna say thank you so much. When Netflix raises Netflix by six bucks, whoever's closest in bringing the most value to the customer wins. You can't be in a referral-based business. What You're a local sucker. Service local service ads with Google. Have you, have yeah, you I'm fine with that, but you're still in, you're basically in intent-based transactional sales mode and I want you to be the authority. You're, you're marketing to a local area. Right. Put out a video every day of how people should be maintaining their homes. I think every service provider should put out content of how not, that, to, to people on Facebook of how not to have to use them. I believe in that the most. I believe in it the most. It's my number one thesis. I believe in it. And so, do you know how many mechanics make money on something that you could have changed a spark plug for? I'll give you a person that would fall for it every time. I have no concept of how a car works. I'm completely baffled by the modern automobile. Just don't know. Give a fuck. <laughs> I take no pro- like I love when people like my buddies are like you're not a man I'm like fuck you I'm like how much money do you have <laughs> you know like like you know what's the definition of a man you know like cool I don't know how to change my car I'm like I have enough money to have multiple people change it I'll buy a new fucking car <laughs> like it doesn't work I'll buy a new one like you know like you know whatever like everybody has their own skin but like I think you want to build trust right. hey. I, I talked to a roofer friend. I'm like, hey, you need to put out content every day of the stuff people should be doing to maintain their roof so they don't have to pay you 30000 or 8000 you know? And they've been doing it and it's working. And, and what platform would be best? Facebook. 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 Make content, run ads against people in the neighborhoods that you're trying to reach. Okay. It'll show up in their feed. It's foreign to me because you're telling me, but I've never done, I've only done Facebook ads which translated into Instagram promotion. Okay. You know? Is that what you're talking about? Are you nope. talking about actual Facebook? Facebook ads on Facebook where you know exactly what you're saying against who you're saying it to. Give me the bit, your best town. Um, my best town? Yeah. Like, that you do business in. That's uh, the name of the town. Uh, Granada Hills. Great. You make a video. Hey, Granada Hills, it's me. I'm servicing a lot of you. I want to service less of you. Let me explain. So many of you are paying me five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 to do X, but if you actually spend $130 a month doing this, Less of you would need me. That is the single best thing you could ever do for your business. Guys, I learned this from Wine Library TV. This is horrible. Do not buy this. I'm selling it. Uh-huh. <laughs> People are watching like, what the fuck is this guy up to? I wasn't even sure. I just subconsciously knew that if I was good for the customer, that'd be good for me. Yeah. It wasn't good for this. We were gonna have a trouble selling this now. <laughs> but in the macro, I was building a relationship. I'm giving away all my marketing advice for free so you don't have to, like, right? To the point where, look at how meta this is. It's all free, but you're here, paying. Trust was built. Then I get even more scared. I'm like, fuck, they're coming, they're paying. We have to make this awesome. The stuff that you've, the reason you re- reacted even after seven years of like awesome is like what we've done so far and you know, like it's valuable. Because you're at a big enough business scale. What was smart about 4Ds was pricing it expensive enough so that people that were coming through weren't hoping and dreaming and it's not a lottery ticket. It means you're far enough along to get a singular piece of advice that can make the arbitrage of $12,000 worth it. Got it? That's how it clicked. Make sense? Then you make it a, uh, apologize, then you make it a phone call ad. If you go older, I like the phone ads where you put content but there's a phone number, then they just click it right from there. That's on Facebook, you're saying. So right on the Facebook ads, there's a little call, call to action button or something like that. That's right. Jim, we'll set out 15 minutes next week. If you want to do some of this. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so uh, we actually have fired our best phone rep. We actually were about to fire them, and they let go of themselves. Best feeling. It was a hu- <laughs> huge missed opportunity for you. Uh, huge. <laughs> huge. You didn't make an impact in culture because they left on their terms, not you firing them. Huge miss. I mean it. Okay. Give that thought to like everybody else. I know that you don't what run if, the whole company. What if she beat us too? Like, like, we she didn't. She won the game. You guys lost. 
I'm devastated when that happens at Vayner. At Vayner when I'm, like, there's people that are fired at Vayner right now in my head, but it might take me three and a half months to make it happen for a magnitude of reasons. Occasionally that person will quit and I'm devastated because I wasn't able through my actions to show the rest of the company that we know that that person wasn't right. Do you tell them that, hey, I fired this person? People know everything. She got ahead of you guys. She won. But even if we, like, we wanted to let, like, she was like a cancer. Your employees don't know that. They don't believe you. And then they're going and saying something to the employees before they leave, so it's like. A hundred percent. She controlled, she controlled the narrative. Missed opportunity, but still a good net positive. But it's something to think about. And I know that you don't ball the control. I remember kind of the narrative from the sneaker thing, whatever, but like, just that kind of back to like what I'm trying to do here. It's advice for everybody else. It's it's for people that don't like to fire. It's the double damage because they have the narrative. They control it. I'm out of this fucking. They were to cancer. They know that they're not on point with you, so they got ahead of it, and then they tell everybody, "I'm leaving this shit place. This place always sucked. I leave," and they have all the leverage. Got it? I know I'm right. Correct. And then you have collateral damage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I fired a real problematic employee who had cultivator in the 50s. And uh, he was fan- I mean, he came over Thanksgiving dinner to my house. Like, he became a friend. Yep. And it was so hard to fire him because I knew he became a personal friend. Yeah. He wasn't performing in my company. Yep. So I had to bring him in and he was blindsided. Yep. Yep. And told him lies about him. Yeah. And if I hadn't fired him and he'd done that while he was still an employee, mm-hmm. it would have been the double damage. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You gotta you gotta always control the narrative. Mm-hmm. It's I I'm, I'm telling you, it's you notice how I reacted? It's like one of my most difficult things running this co. Because sometimes there's reasons not to fire somebody, whether it, I gotta transition a client, whether one of the biggest reasons I don't fire clients is I have to build equity with the three or four people around them because they've already been doing cancer and I gotta siphon the equity to me before I fire them. Yeah. Example. Sally's shit, the, her crew is being manipulated by Sally. I like that crew and there's a lot of great people. I've gotta spend two months between me and other managers to build equity with them so they understand Sally's garbage and then you get rid of Sally because if you get rid of Sally before then, they leave too. Like it's the most funny thing ever. It's like parents. Remember all the shit you thought your parents didn't know but then you got older and they're like, I fucking knew you were jumping out the window and hooking up with Rick. And you're like, fuck mom, how'd you know? Cause you know. I love when my employees think I don't know. I fucking know everything. <laughs> no, but right, right, Nick. Like, like, like that was like an evolution, right? It's interesting, right? Yeah, you're super on it, but like. Anyway, that's not your question. Go ahead. So uh, I'm just I'm, I'm looking for some perspective and strategy in auto. So Agent 2021, uh, I had a good time. Good things and bad things I liked about it. But yes. It got me thinking of more ideas. Good. And I wanted to know, like, so I was like, man, I can build the machine here really well as a company, but then look, we got we started interviewing videographers, um, uh, content creators, and I want to know like, when it comes to the best strategy, I don't know the best way to figure out where auto's going. I know there's a few companies like Carvana, they're like, get rid of dealership shift is like new way to buy inside a car, so I was like, we'll just be the car buyer. We'll just strictly buy and we, we wholesale all our cars, we'll sell them in franchise dealerships. But, is that just for, like, should I be thinking more of how can I help everyone in all dealerships? Or hey, is this where it's, is this kind of where we should be going down the... Tier three auto dealerships mm-hmm. are going to be around for minimally another decade because you haven't seen enough transition happen yet. Let's start with that. Transition in like... Meaning like you're not seeing car dealerships close all the time. You're not seeing Ford announce that they're not gonna do tier three anymore. There hasn't been anything that's happened. And even when Ford says, we're gonna not do dealerships anymore, it's gonna take them five years because there's deals in place. So I think a lot of times people see the future but don't realize how long it takes. I made that mistake. In 1998, I decided, when I came back, we launched in 96, 
I start running the company in 98 the store and I decide by the year 2000, that was 18 months. This is what's so funny about being a kid. You think 18 months is like a million years. You know, I'm like by the year 2000, I'll never forget this. I couldn't have been more wrong. By the year 2000, everybody will come into my wine store and scan every barcode because I made up that phones would have scanners on them by then uh-huh. and, and they'll know the price of every wine and I'm gonna have to lower the price and be the lowest price on everything because I I still to this day don't know when you sell when you sell a service you can talk about it from a service standpoint I still don't know how to explain to somebody if I sell a bottle of wine why somebody else selling it cheaper why they should buy it for me I do not understand and I never did and that's why Wine Library had the best prices on every fucking wine in America when I ran the store because I don't understand what the answer to that question is uh, and so I lowered the prices of every single product crushed our margin, but it never happened. We still don't have it. And, and that's, how I, that's how I've gotten good. If you notice, I know a lot of you guys follow, I'm so much more right than everybody else about VR 24 months ago when everybody was talking about it. Right? Everybody said, right? Everybody was all freak getting fired up and I was like, it's not even close. And here we are 24 months later and still nothing has happened. Not even the beginnings of something. Same thing that's happening with machine learning and AI right now. Everyone's talking about it every day. And I'm like, that's cool. And there's a lot more going on there, but the things that people say it's going to do are 13 years from now. So, yes, do I think cars are going direct to consumer? Yes, I do. Do I think it's going to take a decade to three? I do. The end. And I think youngsters who are progressive could get caught on the timing of innovation. Got it? I think that you are, because you haven't lived through a couple cycles, are gonna see things that are right because you're digitally native, you're younger, you're coming from a different perspective. It's gonna take longer than you think for it to materialize. I believe that online dating was gonna be mainstream in 1998. It really probably, I mean Match.com at some level, but like Tinder in 2012, or I'm trying to think now, like. It took a long time, but I knew it would happen, but nobody believed me when it happened. It's like sports cards right now. It's already happened. I know it's gonna happen. Most people are like looking at me like, oh, you just, because you liked it when you were, like, they don't see it yet. Last last question. So I have, so with that, I have all these ideas, but I think that as a company, we need more money to do it. I think we need more capital, so. Fine. What do you, I guess, what do you do with that? Like, where do you go? Do you have control? So they are open, to what we, we talked about, there's four of us, and we talked about, hey, should we fix everything first and then ask for money, or just ask for money and then go from there? Well, first, can you make money instead of asking for it, or no? Can make money, yeah, we're, we're, so we're profitable. Can you make more? We can, but, so sometimes it gets very tight when it comes to, I got so it. like, if the car doesn't sell out, I got it. it'll get really, yeah. really tight. <laughs> yep. um, and sometimes if you want to go more, it'll get if, Look, I think raising capital on your terms and your advantage is a good idea. I don't think that's how it ends up most times. Whoever's asking for the money has less leverage. Right, right. So I'm a big fan of like creating something that has people asking to give you money. Mm-hmm. Whoever asks first blinked. That's how I think about that. Thank you. So many questions. Let's go. Um, all right, so in my building my personal brand, I already speak, um, but I want to do more speaking. However, I'm a mom of three, and they're they're it. They're of course, everything. yeah, of course. So, have I, you have you gotten remarkable at eliminating other things besides yep. those two things? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good there. Good. Like. Okay. Um, how do I train from the beginning? Because I feel like this is a beginning for me. Um, anyone who reaches out to me about a speaking engagement that I can bring just as much value from my cute pink velvet couch in my office, ring light, whatever, no. That's what you want, it's not what they want. Okay. I mean, there's nothing I can do to make that nope. possible. I do not believe so. I close people paying me 185,000 to give a speech 8,000 times easier than I pay than I close people paying me 35,000 to simulcast it. Okay. And that's consistent for everybody. 
It's experience. So I'll just have to put off traveling so much because I just I can't do it. I won't do it. There's another thing. Yeah. Charge more. Okay. Right? Now you may be in the like that like if you're willing to not travel, you now have leverage. So this is like it's you shouldn't say no. You should ask for a remarkable amount more than you're accustomed to now. That's what I did. When I when I started building Vayner Media, mm-hmm. I, I was like, okay, now I'm gonna build Vayner Media. Jess, were you there? Did you were you there before I was kind of day-to-day CEO or you came right as I was kind of there? Yeah. So like th- what's really interesting is, you know, you might have saw like Vayner Media, I guess, because we formed the LLC on April 15th, even though AJ wasn't out of school yet, turned 10. But for me it's always eight because I really didn't operate this business the first two years because I was busy with Wine Library. I was really still really running that. And then I'd written Crush It and the whole Gary Vee thing was starting. Um, and so when I decided in September 2011 to run VaynerMedia for real, to actually be the CEO, I didn't want to speak as much because I wanted to build a business. So I moved my fee from 5000 to 15000 And what ended up happening was it was awesome because, okay, a bunch of people said go fuck yourself. You think you're a big shot, right? And that was fine. But some people said yes, and I was like, really? Okay, amazing. <laughs> and so like, I don't know what you're charging now, but if you're willing not to travel because you gotta be home more and whatever, you're gonna find a new remarkable thing, which is you might be able to get more. Okay. Okay. That was like one of the great, I'll never forget that year where like the year prior I spoke like 11 or 15 or 22 times, and the next year I spoke like seven but made the same money. It was a really powerful moment. Now, I had momentum, I was like, you know, it's, it's a marketplace, right. you know? But yes, I mean, as fact, anytime somebody says I'm looking to become a speaker, I'm always like, speak as much as you can for as free as much as you can. I mean, look, you've got your life. Yeah. And like, I think it's really hard. I have a lot of, it's really hard for everybody, but double, I have double empathy for, you know, a mom because I think there's just inherent, like, you birthed this human kind of thing. I think there's, and there's social and the way, you know, social pressures and, how you grew up and ideologies of your grandmother's grandmother that trickle down. Um, it's hard to balance to begin with, but yeah. but, but I can it's do better it. than having terminal it. cancer. Right, right. You know, it's, that's, <laughs> but yeah. it, it definitely feels like that. You know, it's easy for you, like it's fun to pontificate. You're really thrilled right now that you do not have terminal cancer. And like that's where I always go. Like, like you know, like, like hey, it sucks that maybe you, like that you can't, go 150% on the business because you have, you know, parenting obligations and wants and needs and ambitions. You could have been born in Cambodia like and not had the same opportunities you had being a white woman in America. Like I'm always playing the this pisses me off, but I can spend the rest of my life talking about all the things that are worse. And I I do believe in that perspective. I don't because you'll get crippled otherwise. Yeah. You know? I appreciate you recognizing the, that though. I believe that. Like I think it's, I hate when dudes are like, it's the same, like it's the least same thing of all time. It is. Yeah. Um, so I'm ready to start my pillar content. Good. And the trickle down, which Podcast, I'm really excited about. Vogue, what are you thinking? I'm not sure. So I, I'm good, so camera is where I've shine. been my whole life. Yeah. So it's, good. it's what I do. And I feel like I can deliver my message um, just differently than a lot of people. So I want to start with video. Uh, I'm a big fan of videoing a podcast. Me too. Okay, good, good. This is what this is what I was thinking the other day. That's great. I'm a big fan of it. Okay. You get both. Yes. Film the podcast. And you, we've all seen it, right? Like Imus, sports radio does it, Mike and Mike. Like you see it on cable TV. It's a radio show being filmed, which means it's a TV show. It, it's exactly the same for us. I think my strength though comes from the training aspect, the, just kind of what you do. So it's sound bites. It is. So you should, you should do a QA show. Okay. Watch what I do, not what I say. When I came back, and seven years, what are we in, 19? Yeah, so you know this. Like, my career has a really funny moment in it, which is when I went double down on Vayner. Like, 2000, September 2011 to like 13, 14. I was pretty quiet for me on the internet. There's very little, like, there's only the, if you look at it, there's only like the keynotes, there's like a couple things. Like I was very quiet. And then when I came back, 
I was more self-aware and what did I start? The Ask Gary V show. I mean, I, I sometimes when I talk to Caleb or anybody on my team, like, you know, I'm the breakout personality in the business space in this last couple years while actively being a CEO and CEO of a ma- massive company. And when I talk to them, like, could you imagine if I was just Gary V? Like every morning I would do a fucking morning show from like 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. just Q&A and would like take, you think I'm penetrating all the channels now? It'd be over. I would do it every day. It's my favorite thing to do. Tea with Gary Vee. You know like, (laughs) nice glass of tea, just put them on, call me. Boom, 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 boom. Clip, 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 distribute, distribute. Every day. Look how pumped we get when we do, one of the reasons I did 4Ds was for the fucking, what did I just say, the firing is the, like, I don't know, like it's fucking good. I can't, I can't wait for that piece of content. Oh, the default knowing or guessing, no, like that fucking thing's gonna kill on LinkedIn. That's two million in the bank. <laughs> but I need to be asked. It's hard to like self-start. Like, it's not, I apologize. I'm really great at self-starting, that's why I was good. It's just, I only am gonna say the same things that I believe in. The only time I do new shit is when I'm asked. That's why I started, and if you know that about yourself, make it a Q and A show, right? Yeah, which is so much fun. So fun, especially when you stay in your, the biggest thing I'll tell you is just stay in your lane. I think a lot of people when they start Q and A have a sense of like, I'm an expert and I should have an answer for this. Like, it happened uh, yesterday, I don't know, right? What was that? I was pumped. I don't know, nonetheless, I was super pumped to tell them. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I love that. Yep. Listened, uh, no questions. <laughs> I didn't have enough engagement yet, so there's a certain time that you want to start and launch a Q&A. Otherwise no I'll questions. give you a good one, though. If like nobody knows, for people out there who want to start a Q&A show that nobody knows in the world, let's say you want to, go to Twitter, yeah. search Dollar. terms, find questions that people are actually asking the ethos and answer them. Mm-hmm. By the way, by the way, that is the actual origin story of Gary Vee. Nobody in the world knew who I was when I started Wine Library TV. I went on Twitter, searched wine terms, and answered questions. Because I knew what I was talking about about wine, nobody knew that I knew. So you can literally, if you, like you should go watch an old Ask Gary Vee. I clip, the, make the image from the question on Twitter, but you could do that with somebody not asking you the question. John in Albuquerque asked, not me, but the world, so I'll answer it. What should I do when my, you know? What else? How much time do I have? Uh, officially 10. 10 more minutes? We do five and then a picture. Okay. Great. Anything else? This is nothing to do with my brand. Good. Just kidding, anyway. Of course. Okay, so I just read um, Titan, no, you were in a, you were asked in a book, t- Mentors, oh, Tribe uh, of Mentors. Okay. Tribe, cool. no, tribe of, men, Ferris. of mentors. Ferris or Gonan? Ferris. Yeah, I think it was Ferris. Titans, right? No, 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 no. Oh, there's two? Two different ones. Okay. Well, in Timmy's the, a fucking beast. He just writes. Let me tell you what you said. You said you had someone <laughs> that travels with you, that does personal training. Yes. And then body work. Yes. Oh, soft tissue work. Okay. I'm, do, I'm okay. doing it right now. Okay. I don't so know if you notice what I'm doing. I'm literally. I'm literally doing it right now. So I want to know because I just entered this. I'm literally doing it right now. Tell me what it does, because this is this has been brought to my attention. Okay. I feel like I need it. So I don't I don't really know, <laughs> but here's what I know. If you continuously rub with a ball, with your fist, with a fork, on this, like there is a soft tissue. There's a fascia that is built up. I have it so bad right here. So. I hurt my back when I was a kid in the liquor store and so what ended up happening was subconsciously and I can see it in old videos, I would do this. And what happened was that became my actual posture and in that slight bend, there's just a lot of gunk built up here and as I've learned to like stretch out, it's still here. I mean this fucking hurt and when I tell you some of, here's the craziest part about this game. Right now, if like, I'm gonna show you. (laughs) Sorry, I know this is, but you have to, you have to, look at this. Like, I have to go, flow. like, I'm like literally bruising. Like, it's, what you don't know, what you don't know is how crazy this is. Here's why. I've now been on this for like three years and I've only discovered that I have more tissue stuff to do around my, like, IT band here three weeks ago. And I'm like poking and prodding constantly. 
and you don't even, your brain doesn't want you to touch it. This is real. Your brain is keeping you away from it. It's this crazy game, like I feel like I could, like I wish Jordan was here. You're almost playing against yourself. You don't even realize it's happening. But like there's literally places in your body right now where you have like fascia and like soft tissue issues that you have no idea that it's happening and the second you hit it, it like blows your mind. Oh, my psoas. Dude, first of all, everything was fucked up on me when I started. All of it. All of it. The psoas is nuts. The first, you know where it started? My adductor, right? My, the first thing that ever happened, Jordan's very good at soft tissue work and he did it for baseball players because they get a lot of gunky stuff. With and I was doing something and he's like, hey, and, he ta- and I almost jumped out of the gym. You have to understand, you're so, it's right here. It's right here, right? It's like in play, it's not like some weird, right? It's right here. I have no idea what he's talking about. He goes, huh? I go, Phew. Like it was so fucked up, so tight. Anyway, you know, like there's a stick that he has that's the best, the blue ball, like all this shit. Like it's changed my life. Here's why. Actually, I'm gonna show you guys. I think I have a picture of it. This is so crazy to me. God, I really hope I have this. I gotta show you something that is almost uncomfortably ridiculous. Fuck. Um, I'm gonna show you a picture. Yep, here we go. Almost. God, I'm so hopeful that I have it. Okay, here we go. Yes, I showed it to you. What? Really, you have it? I think I might have it. Guys, when I tell you that I'm so passionate about you guys doing this, it's, it changed my life. Let me tell you how. I sleep better, when I travel I feel better, I feel better just second to second. Way more than losing weight, way more than having muscles. It's changed the way I actually walk and maneuver around life. It, like you don't even, it's what, I'm so in tune with myself and all this stuff but I gotta tell you, it's a, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It is, shit, I don't have it. Um, you have, you're finding it? I'll find it. Text Jordan real quick. He'll text it to you. It's something I, I just found the one, oh dude. dude, it's so crazy guys. This hurts so, like I'm barely touching in between two ribs right now. Anyway, it like, oh God, like it, so QL, I don't know how educated people are on this shit, I don't even know if I'm using the right word, but there's a QL muscle right here and I'm like, it's still bothering me. Like anyway, here was what he's looking for. You're gonna see a picture of me when Jordan really figured out the biggest issue, which was my QL, I had to do this. And he said, okay, turn your legs like this, put your hand here, and now I want you to do this and I want you to go this way. And what you'll see in the picture is I go like this far and I wasn't even able to keep this hand free. I used it to brace and my face looks like this. Uh. And now what I'm able to, you know, like like really able to go and I can have my, but like this whole thing was so tight that I wasn't able to even move. Like I'm not joking. Like I really can't wait for you guys to see it. It's one year exactly apart. I literally was like this. <laughs> like, like, and what's crazy is you don't even know it. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, you don't even know that's, because it becomes your norm. It just, oh man, you found it? Can you throw, you're gonna throw it up here? I'm so pumped right now. <laughs> Does this tissue work have a specific name? Yes. It's co- yes. Yes. Structural integrative oh. one. Dude, I'm so fucked up still in my QL. Fuck, it hurts. Crap. I'll get it. I'll get it. This new spot is just not. Dude, I'm so pumped to see this. You got it? Yeah. Can we ask you a question while you're Yes, 100%. Do you ever feel like you get like too famous? Or like, it's it's like. Look at this. Hold on. Can you zoom? Can you. Can you. Can, does it work like that? Guys, oh, yeah. this is. Look at this. This is me with all my might trying to go to the left. I'm going nowhere. Hand support. Dead. <laughs> One year later. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that what the human grudge? 
<laughs> What's that? Is that with the human garage? Did you go with them? The human garage? I don't know. What's that? It's just like some people out of Venice. They work on your fascia and they. No, it's just training. It's training. Not those no, this is just. But but like one more time, like scroll in it. Like throw. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Wow. It's big. You're just bad. And like what you don't know what that actually means is things like, I got one. Um, when I now go for something, like I used to do this. Oh, actually, here's a good one. Because how fucked up I was left to right, when Jordan was like, pick up a weight, and like right hand weight over here, I would just do this. But when he was like, pick up that weight, I would do this. Mm. I had no range. Like I used to, uh, I have to, like I mandate to be on the left side of, an air, of the airplane because when I would be on the right side and try to sleep, this wouldn't stretch. Like crazy shit that you would never think about. Like just, it's, it changed my life. Another thing that's about to change my life is I, I'm gonna send you this. Dio, I want you to put this up. This is gonna segue to my next thing. Uh, do I ever think I'm getting too famous? Yeah, like does it get too much to handle? Like people like stop you? Like, yeah. You're like, okay, I should stop this. Let's I won't, I thing. can't stop it. I like it too much. It's it's the good outweighs the bad. And not about and not about the selfishness of like I like being famous. It's that I feel too good when I'm changing somebody's life. I can't replicate the high of somebody emailing me and saying I was abused. Guys, you don't know what I get. Mm-hmm. Like Yeah. What are those? You have all of those? I have bought 40 Three, so listen to my hot take on this. <laughs> I believe that this is the number one underpriced car- card in the world. Now, you guys all know, I hate Michael Jordan more than breathing. I've never worn a pair of Jordans, I hate them, but this is the number one underpriced product in the world right now. This is a Michael Jordan rookie sticker card, not the regular card. The regular card's 5,000 when it's graded a nine like this. This is how they grade them. They put them in cases and then they give them a you can see the nine there. Ten is the best nine. This this card is selling for like a thousand. I started buying them a couple months ago when they were seven hundred, but I, I'm like driving up the price because it's just drying up. But I think this card should be worth just as much as the regular six thousand dollar one because there's just as many made of this as the regular one, and these are even harder to get good grades because the stickers were even more awkward. So I'm gonna buy them all that I can. There's still, I mean, I have. 67 or 47, I'm gonna try to buy 500, there's probably hundreds of thousands, and then I'm gonna tell my whole community to go and buy them, and then I'm gonna educate people on why in supply and demand, normal non-emotion, this should equally be worth $6,000. And I think it'll then go to $6,000. Can I buy one? Yep, you can go on eBay, <laughs> and you should. Honestly, this is, you know what, back to like, you know my, my whole game of like, people have no money and I'm trying to get them to get $1,000 by flipping $1 to this, this whole sports card thing, the reason I'm most passionate, the number one question I have that I do not know how to answer, which pisses me off, is, hey Gary, I have $18,000, how should I invest it? It's a tricky number. Like, you know, like, what real estate do you buy? Like, Facebook, Netflix stock, like, ugh, it's, you know, this. I really think that cards are gonna go up so much and be so liquid that a lot of people, if they're really smart, and I'm gonna tell them what to buy after I buy a little for myself, uh, are gonna be able to turn 18s into hundreds. I think somebody can easily, easily. It's scary to me how realistic turning 18,000 to 100,000 sports cards will be over the next 18 months. I really believe that. I have one of those Michael Jordan 24 karat gold. Garbage. Garbage. <laughs> no, no, listen, I have unlimited garbage. So I have, bro, I have so much garbage. <laughs> everything, everything you have, like, mo- everything's garbage in that, like, they're garbage. Yeah. But like, I heard you mention about the Akeem Elijah one. Is I'm buying, that a longer term? That's a 30 year play. I'm buying up all Akeems because I think Africa culture is going to be like a major. I think China's going to build. China and Africa. Africa's the next continent to blow up. And I think African culture and like basketball's global <gasps> and Joel Embiid and Africa and, Af- like, and Akeem's a great one. Like, yeah. I, I be- very simply, I believe in 34 years that I will sell a ton of my Akeem Olajuwon rookie cards that I'm buying for 200 bucks now to African businessmen and women for 4,000. Why do you think it's become-
becoming so big because the kids are getting back into it? The, 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 the new generation? Three things. One, I think that 43 year olds are now ha- at an age where they have six and seven year olds that are into it and we're playing the nostalgia play, the same reason G.I. Joe and Strawberry Shortcake reboot every 30 years. This is what we always do. We want our kids to do what we did. It's like a thing. Two, sneaker flipping. All these 16, 17, 18 year old hucksters, hustlers like me are in sneaker flipping but they can't get enough supply. Like when they're right, they have to wait online, buy one pair and make 600 bucks. When you're right about Jordan or Giannis or Steph Curry, you can buy 40,000 of them. So it's the graduation step to the kids that are doing sneakers for the flip. Three, gambling. There's going to be Zion cards. One of the things that's happening in sports cards now is you can get one of one, like it's the only card like that in the world, signature cards, pieces of the jersey, limited edition stuff, supply and demand. There's only 25 of these Zions in the world. There's only 25. There was a billion Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards. Got it? So soon, once people actually understand what's happening with sports cards, there's gonna be a knowledge base, even like people in my office, just life, that you can go into a card store or Walmart, buy an $8 pack of Prism (coughs) basketball, and you could pull a $40,000 Zion rookie. And unlike a lottery ticket, you could pull out the regular Zion that's worth 25. So gambling. And because of daily fantasy and gambling, people watch more sports when they care. So one of the things people will do is like, if you think like I do, like De'Aaron Fox is gonna be a very good basketball player. Like next, I'm buying up a ton of De'Aaron Fox rookie cards right now because I think he's like very good. And next year, I'm actually gonna care what the Sacramento Kings are doing every night because I have financial vested interest and De'Aaron Fox is going from 14 bucks that I'm buying them now to 40 bucks. Five minutes ago, I could care less if Luka Donic got hurt or Dallas did well. I've bought, I'm buying 700 Luka rookie cards for next year and so now I care. People like to do things to make them care about things. That's why they bet. It's not just trying to make money, it's that you all of a sudden care to watch that playoff game tonight. It enhances the experience.